Welcome everybody. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Thanks for joining us for this special lecture sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center and the University of Oregon's Department of Physics and delivered by Brown University Professor of Physics and President of the National Society of Black Physicists, Stefan Alexander. But before I welcome my colleague, Richard Taylor, who will introduce Professor Alexander, I have a couple of quick announcements. Professor Alexander has generously agreed to take questions after the talk. If you have questions at that point, please share your questions using the Q&A feature of Zoom. I'll moderate and ask the questions. We've also enabled the closed captioning function of Zoom. You can activate captions by hovering over the live transcript option at the bottom of the Zoom window. Professor Alexander's talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing tomorrow on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. I also need to give some thanks. First, uh, thanks to Giant Benavar, Richard Taylor, and the UO Physics Department for their partnership in making this webinar with Stefan Alexander possible. Thanks also to this event's co-sponsors, the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Oregon. Thanks too, as always, to the wonderful staff of the Oregon Humanities Center for their incomparable competence, commitment, and creativity. And last but not least, thanks to the OHC's generous donors, without whom we could not sponsor exciting public programs and lectures by world-class lecturers like today's event. I'm pleased now to introduce Richard Taylor, Professor and Head of Physics at the University of Oregon, who will introduce our speaker for today. Like Stefan Alexander, Richard Taylor uh, is an accomplished, awarded, and admi admired physicist with a deep and abiding commitment to the creative arts. Having earned a PhD in physics and an MA in art theory, Richard studies fractals, natural patterns that repeat at increasingly fine size scales in the varied and interdisciplinary fields of neuroscience, psychology, physiology, vision science, and visual art. The diverse applications of his work range from sight restoration using retinal implants to stress reduction using art to the application of fractal analysis to uh, uh, verify the authenticity of paintings by the abstract expressionist painter Jackson Pollock. Given the interdisciplinary breadth of Richard's experience and expertise, it's not surprising that he also served on the faculty advisory board of the Oregon Humanities Center. Please join me in welcoming Richard Taylor. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, let me start by thanking Paul and uh, Giant um, for making this possible, for inviting um, Stefan. And of course, thanks to Stefan for coming today. Uh, if you haven't seen Paul's interview with Stefan, please check it out because it, it really shows the breadth of uh, Stefan's achievements. And when I look at Stefan's achievements, it makes me wonder whether he's actually found uh, eight days a week to do all of this work rather than the seven that we've all got. Um, a, a few notes about Stefan. So he is a professor of physics, an affiliate professor in Africana studies at Brown University. He's also the executive director of the Harlem Gallery of Science and the president of the National Society of Black Physicists. And he's held previous positions at Stanford, Imperial College, Penn State, Dartmouth, and Haverford College. He's a theoretical physicist specializing in cosmology, particle physics, and quantum gravity. And he also plays jazz saxophone and explores the interconnections between music, physics, mathematics and technology through recordings, performance, teaching, and public lectures. In 2017, he authored the book, The Jazz of Physics, The Secret Link Between Music and the Structure of the Universe. And he's just finished his second book called The Fear of the Black Universe, An Outsider's Guide to the Future of Physics. So today he'll give a talk, what a scientist learned from jazz about innovation, Stefan, it's a huge pleasure to have you here, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you, um, Professor Taylor and Professor Peppis, and uh, definitely thanks to the giant, giant Vannevar, um, 
who has been a great pleasure to have, you know, cross paths for many times over the years. Um, and um, yeah, so the first thing I want to just say is um, it's a it's a true pleasure um, to have engaged um, the, the UO community earlier on today. I was really impressed with especially the students um, <clears throat> and talking to other faculty. Um, and it was it, it's you guys have something really special there and keep keep on keeping on as my middle school um, principal, Dr. Brindle used to say. Um, so uh, let's begin. Yeah. So I think what we're going to do, right, is that the way I've just designed this talk is to keep you all awake. <laughs> well, to hope to keep you guys awake. And what I mean, mean by that is that it's going to be more of vignettes or storytelling. And in the spirit of Richard Feynman, you know, the, the hope is that the concepts and the ideas that I I'm trying, I'll try to communicate will be embedded in these stories. But let's see how it, how it goes. And the talk was designed to be on the order of like an hour, but I've decided to cut, to chop the talk down because I had so much fun engaging with the UO community um, that I'm actually more interested in um, with um, Dr. Peppers um, engaging in some conversation with y'all. So let's, um, let's begin. I'm not gonna, I guess, share screen. And um, I'm looking for verification as to whether you're seeing the, the title. Yes? We can see it. Okay, beautiful. Um, okay, so, um, so that's the title of my talk. What can a scientist, what a scientist learn from, um, from jazz about innovation? Now, let me, look, uh, full disclosure here. This is my, th this is this scientist, okay? There is, really no science behind these, these, this is purely from my experience. And I, I just learned, for example, that um, Professor Cohen is a jazz musician himself. And we promised that we were gonna jam with each other once the dust settles and he's gonna come out East, give a talk at Brown and we're gonna play. Um, that's gonna, that's the alibi. <laughs> I hope the Dean's not there hearing this. Um, but now I'm gonna convince you that there's value to physics by playing jazz, right? So it's all good. Um, so. So I, I just want to say that this is my journey, and I hope that some of the lessons that I've learned will, will maybe you know inspire you to continue on your own journey in terms of um, engaging the arts as a scientist and vice versa, um, or as an academic rather. All right, so my journey really begins as when I was a, a young person. I grew up in the Bronx, New York, and I was a very um, inquisitive young person. But, you know, when I looked out there growing up in the Bronx, and I remember being very interested in scientific things. Um, but, you know, when I looked out there when I say looking out the media or like just role models back then, I, you know, I'm a product of the 80s. Um, I really didn't see much. I, I mean, un unfortunately, Neil deGrasse Tyson wasn't alive. At, I mean, no, he was alive. I'm sorry. He's older than me. Um, but he, he wasn't on the scene yet or other other, you know, in the Bronx. So, I, so my point there is that that being a musician was also something that was on the table. Uh, I grew up in a very musical family. Hip hop music was very much happening in the Bronx um, during that time. And so, you know, I, I, my point there was that those two things were very much um, in, in tension, not tension, but this idea of maybe want to become a scientist, but not really seeing a pathway, not really seeing encouragement from society as, as a whole. But, you know, and that kind of becoming a musician is a little bit more uh, maybe attractive or you know more ac accessible but the point there was that i kind of want to just lay down that that was very much attention it was also um just to be honest like you know <clears throat> it wasn't cool to be a scientist you know like you know um the image of a scientist was like some geeky person that's not a non-cool geeky person um that has no social skills uh, think about the nutty professor like and, you know, being a musician is, you know, a hip hop artist like MC Rakim. But the difference between MC Rakim is that he was known to be the greatest MC in my generation. And I think some people will argue of all generations, but he was a person that made it, he was, he belonged to, uh, you know, that, um, that generation of hip hop artists that in, in their rhymes embedded like, scientific concepts and what they call supreme mathematics or dropping science and kicking knowledge. And so if you look at like this line he has here um, from his um, very famous song, My Melody, <clears throat> K 
came out sometime in the mid eighties. He goes, that's what I'm saying. I drop science like a scientist. My melodies are cold the very next episode. Has the mic off in the start and ready to explode. I keep the Mac and fire and hype for these MCs to make them colder. My listener system is kicking like solar. So the idea that, you know, he's not, you know, making reference or making allusions to being in a gang or something like that. He's making allusions to so, you know, solar physics and, you know, Fahrenheit. He's using words, scientific concepts. So in a lot of ways, Rakim, you know, made it okay and cool for somebody, a young person like me to say, to come out of my little scientific closet and maybe try to make my own rhymes. But back then I wasn't really into, into rapping because I, I wasn't that good. But I was actually into like digital sampling and sound synthesis and all these other elements that came in with hip hop culture, all these other innovations. And I'll get back to that. I'll get back to this idea of innovation. Um, the other person was Albert Einstein who really inspired me because um, as I learned about Einstein, I realized that, you know, in terms of the being the, the scientist thing, that he was a person that wore his personality on his sleeve and, you know, was his own person and was still able to do excellent science. And so that was, you know, inspirational that maybe I can continue to just be this, you know, black kid from the Bronx and um, maybe still pursue being a scientist. Um, I'm now gonna fast forward because that was, you know, there was inspirations or other inspirations. You know, I, um, I gave a little TED talk about my high school teacher, Mr. Daniel Kaplan. So there were, you know, there were, and the important thing there is that, you know, we always have the, there are always gonna be people around us to inspire us and we can resonate with those people. And I certainly, I feel like, you know, I definitely had, you know, that, that fortitude. Um, but let me just fast forward, you know, yeah, I went off to graduate school, I worked hard, I, little, I played in a little jazz band, I wasn't as developed as a musician, music was functioning mostly to um, kind of like a hobby to kind of keep me, keep, keep me sane as I was pursuing my PhD, and also making interesting and different friends I was outside of the physics department, although I did have a few friends in the physics department that played music. Um, but then what happened was um, into my after PhD program, I um, had this beautiful opportunity. I became a postdoc at Imperial College in London. And then I also had a joint little position at Columbia University during the summertime. And during the summertime, um, my friend Jaron, Jaron Lanier, who is a virtual reality um, pioneer, who's also a musician. So you can now start seeing that I'm now making friends with scientists who are also musicians, all right? Jaron says to me, hey, he happened to be in New York at the time. You want to go meet my friend Ornette? Um, this was probably the year 2000. You want to meet my friend Ornette? I was like, which Ornette are you talking about? Like Ornette Coleman. Of course, I said, heck yeah. We jumped in the yellow cab, we went down to Midtown, and here we are in Ornette Coleman's thing. And so I remember going into Ornette's place and hanging out with him, and we continued to hang out for many years after that. He kind of became a mentor of mine. Um, and the thing that I, the two things I wanna take away from Ornette um, was that, first of all, he spoke in parables, okay? That's the first thing. So he would, so I would try to ask him questions about, you know, how to play better, how to become a better impro uh, uh, improviser. Because at that point now, I'm in New York City and I'm saying to myself, you know what, I, I now I'm a postdoc, I have a little bit more flexibility. I don't have to take coursework. And I'm going to, you know, focus on my work and, you know, in theoretical physics at the time. But, you know, at doing, doing, you know, the nighttime, I'm going to go to these jazz clubs and, I, you know, I'm going to talk to Ornette Coleman and, um, and the important thing to, to also take note of is that I am green behind the ear. I'm a self-taught jazz musician. I am an outsider, okay? Even though I like to pretend like I'm the guy from the Bronx and da, 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 I am like, you know, my chops are not tight, okay? I, I can't really get around the horn. I'm a tennis saxophone player. And here I am talking to one of the legends of jazz music. And I would come to him with these questions and he actually heard me play. 
But the point about honor that I think is really important to take away as one of the, you know, re he represents, right, the culture, like, you know, the birth, the, you know, going way back to the 40s, right? Like one of the, one of the people that was still alive to live in legends. And he encapsulated this notion of what true inclusivity looks like. So instead of you know brushing me off or putting putting a, a microaggression or body language, it's just like, who are you? You're just like some kid that doesn't know trying to talk to me, the great master. He would actually, you know, it was like there was this kind of um, I don't know what the word is, but it's sort of like I'm going to take you under my wings, kind of, and and just wherever you're at, you're going to play. So he says, okay, let me show you this thing. He just started showing me these scales. And, and, and then one time, I, at that time, I was trying to get very theoretical with him because, you know, I can play that theory game. You know, I got my math chops. And, and so I said, hey, Ornette, you know, what do you think about these uh, chord progressions? And then he looks at me and he goes to me, I'll, I'll give you the answer to those questions if you can tell me where an idea comes from. Um, so th this is encapsulated by this quote from Ornette, which he says, the idea is more important than the style or the contents of the style that you're trying to play in. And when, if we translate this into like being a scientist, right? You know, we think about our styles, the different maybe modalities through which we learn um, competencies or skill, how to do this integral, how to, you know, titrate this and that kind of stuff, right? Um, yes, you know, we all have to learn those things to call ourselves one day a scientist, right? But in the jungle of doing those things, right? Let's not forget that at the end of the day, right? What propels scientific innovation are these ideas. And so on that kind of like reminded me of that as I was also, you know, mainly trying to make way and do something interesting in my field in physics. Now, during that time, I really wanted to learn how to, to how to play my horn. I wanted to learn how to play giant steps. I wanted to learn how to play some Miles Davis and get in, get my horn and just get in with the band and and just jump in and play. But as I said, I wasn't, you know, I'm you know, I'm I'm trying to learn all this stuff. I didn't go to music school. And well, to be fair, I did take music courses in college, but I didn't go to Berkeley and Juilliard, right? I'm just this physics physics person that just really wants to play my horn. And I want to I want to do that stuff. OK, so the other person I want to just kind of uh, when, um, first of all, I want to give thanks to my friend, um, Greg Thomas, who's a, a theorist and um, um, runs this organization called the Jazz Leadership Project. Um, and he was the one that put me on to Albert Murray, Murray who who is a who is a philosopher and a theorist that wrote a book um, amongst many other things called the hero and the blues. And he was the person, one of the main people that basically was responsible for iconicizing jazz music as America's classical music. And he kind of, you know, thinks of jazz and the blues and a lot of facets of African-American culture um, in terms of the innovations that come out of African-American culture as antagonistic cooperation. So you probably hear the story of, you know, some jazz musician, I believe it was Charlie Parker. He's playing, but he's like not as developed as what he would become to be Bird. But when he was less developed, he's at some cutting session, some, um, some, you know, jazz session and some drummer whose name I forget threw the cymbal or tomato, something at him, threw something at him. And, you know, you can see that if you are an outsider, not knowing what's really going on inside in terms of that community to see that as some form of antagonism, some kind of not microaggression, but macroaggression. But there's something cooperative about that. There's something that is also, you know, maybe how the mother bird nudges the baby bird to get off and fly off, right? There's something that's non-coddling about that. There's something that is empowering and, and in, encouraging about that. It doesn't break him it makes him go back and want to practice 14 hours a day to emerge as Bird, all right? The great American genius. Now, I have to tell the following story. When I was um, 
in Europe, um, as for my first postdoc, it was during the year 2000, 1999, around that time. It was a time when a certain president, who we now maybe appreciate a little bit more because of, but anyway, we had this particular, and a lot of people did not like this person in Europe. And I remember the point where even Americans would wear like Canadian, like, like, like backpacks with Canadian flags and stuff like that to avoid being con confronted um, moving through Europe, right? And I remember I was at a, I was at a, um, a pub, um, there was a conference. I was the only one of two American postdocs at this conference because it was an all EU, an EU form conference of theoretical physicists. And this one, I think it was a German guy, physicist comes up to me and goes, I don't like you guys. I don't like you Americans, but I'm gonna talk to you. He said, because the one thing America did that we are envious about, and the only thing that you did that, that, that is ingenious that we wish we did and you didn't borrow from us or steal from us is jazz music. And I said to myself, wow, here I am like, you know, like I'm really proud of that. So what is it about this genius of jazz music? And what I wanna say is, yeah, I wanna talk about this kind of like the innovation and how I, why I feel so strongly that some of the lessons um, embedded in the genius of, of, um, of the jazz community and jazz practice and, um, you know, the, and music, right? And the evolution of that music could be useful for us as scientists. And let me also preface that to say that some of these things are already like hap are happening in the scientific community. I just want to bring it to more light. Um, so the first vignette goes now back, it, that I'm in New York and one place that if you want to learn, you don't go just right, you don't go, the school of jazz is the sessions, the late night sessions at places um, throughout the city, in this case, New York City, this happens everywhere across the United States and across the world. And there's this place called Smalls Jazz Club. And this was, you know, um, we at Smalls, this is um, on, you know, 10th and, and, and 4th Avenue, sorry, in 7th Avenue in um, close to, in, in, in the West Village. And this, it was a very small spot, a basement place. And, and basically, there was a session, a regular session, and then from two o'clock in the morning to six in the morning, this is when, this is a little picture of Smalls. It's a very, and um, we're looking at a great saxophone player who, um, Mark Turner, probably right now my favorite tenor sax player. Um, and the way this worked was, um, you know, you had these superstars that would stick around for the sessions, Roy Hargrove, Robbie Coltrane, Brantford, like all these great players, including some of the elders, they would be there. And then anybody would be allowed to come up to play. Now, this is, I don't know, it's sort of like, um, think of the, the greatest living physicist saying, come get to the blackboard and just write some equations with us. Or, you know, just come play with us. Now, I remember when I was um, this green behind the air person, that could barely play maybe a major scale being you got yeah you come up and your turn now and they would call a tune and then boom it starts then you have to make up a solo you have to improvise you have to just go with it and you squeak the wrong note you do something stupid and then of course one of the roy hargrove comes up and he's right on stage with you and he plays the most beautiful thing and you're in the middle of it being showered and bathe with this, with this sound, you're in the middle of it. And then, you know, after the session, you're hanging with them still, maybe backstage, you know? And, you know, Roy Hargrove um, or Sasha Perry, great, great jazz pianist, will pull me back, you know, pull me back and say, hey, you know what? I like the ideas you're trying to put out, man, but here's the deal, you know, okay, you need to work on these skills, you need to do this, right? That there was something about that, about this Antigone, you know, I knew just from my own, you know, just from playing, no one had to tell me that I maybe felt like I sucked, right? Because I was in the middle of it. That was the point. The point was for me to be there and hear Roy Hargrove throwing something right in my ear next to me. But 
the action also happened afterwards where there was a it wasn't like yeah man you kind of yo we're kind of this man you kind of suck man it was more like you know i hear the ideas you're putting out there all right but yo check this out you know bud powell used to show you see this thing here this is called a tritone think about that and then guess what happened i would like i was so inspired of going like and i would just practice and practice and practice i was so motivated right that that kind of was the thing that so in other words gaining the competencies right the, their presumption and the way they talked to me and treated me was as if like i was one of them already i'm there already but you know what these are the obvious next things you're going to have to do. And once you do these things, like I did it, you come back next week. Right? So there was a sort of like, um, like, and, and when you come back, you can, then you're going to add to this. You're going to add to the music. So in other words, there was a bigger picture. This bigger picture then motivated me to go practice. It wasn't like, oh, well, you know, the, the name of the game here is to know these scales and chord changes. And that's kind of what jazz is. No, it's like, you're, you're going to have to get your own voice. But to do this, you need to do this. Okay, I'm going to go do that. Now, so in, uh, so one of this, um, the lessons, maybe the takeaway here is that the group, in this case, the jazz group, embraces and values difference. Uh, discomfort and individual expression. This defines a group. And those things are the things that motivate you to go and practice. So when we think about what we do in, in science and science pedagogy or the scientific community or in our micro community, are we doing something like that? Or are we paying more attention to whether or not you know your scales and judging people on those things? Um, now, this is consistent with my postdoc advisor, who was also a musician, uh, Michael Peskin, when I was at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. I remember uh, doing those three years, it was my second postdoc. And I remember like with him, he was a very technical person. Um, and, you know, it, it, he would send me off to go do certain calculations and things like this. But I remember, I, I remember feeling like, oh, why am I put myself through this? What's the point? And one day he says to me, you need to learn this stuff so that um, you can take your ideas and make it what you make, make it yours. So like, this is very consistent with, with, with jazz, which is, you know, the, you, the, the goal here is for you to take your ideas and, and, and turn them into some kind of scientific reality. And these are the tools that you're going to, that's going to help you do that. So therefore, guess what I'm going to do if I want to bring my ideas to life? I'm just going to go learn the tools. I'm not learning these tools for the sake of it. It's a stepping stone to the real juice. Um, vignette number two um, is about the necessity of outsiders. And this is consistent, this is about, by the way, related to the, um, diff the idea of difference, embracing difference. So the necessity of outsiders. Uh, let me throw another thing at you. Um, there was a selfish act to people like Roy Hargrove and, um, you know, and, and Mark Turner having a beginner like me on the stage with them, actually. Because the name of the game in jazz, right, is to innovate. It's to not, it's to not keep that, the style or the music, music status. I mean, if you look at, we'll talk about how be, 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 bebop was, was born. But if you look at something like free jazz, it wasn't at first accepted. But then now you know, jazz at Lincoln Center, <laughs> Wynton Marsalis got you know, the, the, the JL band, like, you know, orchestra playing on it, Coleman, right? So the point here is that jazz, the definition part of, part of what jazz is, right, is this, is an evolutionary process of it always evolving and changing, right? And to necessitate that requires people who are playing different stuff. So in other words, let me put it this way. Now, this one is gonna be a little bit hard to accept, okay? But what if I told you that um, great jazz musicians actually want to have beginners with them because it opens it, it, it they, they all of a sudden they hear different things. If you play maybe the wrong scale, their ears are so developed that that is interesting to them and gives them ideas. And this is very consistent with my, um, you know, my, my first PhD advisor, Leon Cooper, 
um, you know, is a Nobel laureate. I mean, he knows so much physics that he's not interested in talking to people that know the same physics that he knows. He kind of likes to have students um, and um, sometimes collaborators who just, who are coming from left field. And they might be also green behind the ear because that, you never know where the new idea is going to come from. Um, so the evolution and the advancement of jazz relies on the rules themselves or what you consider to be the rules at the time to actually be broken. Now, obviously, you know, you kind of need to know the rules to properly break them, but it never hurts if somebody just comes in and just breaks the rule anyway. And the point is that um, the, the tradition uh, embraces both types of rule breakers. Now, the birth of bebop that happened at Minton's Playhouse, uh, I believe 118th Street, um, happened, a lot of it happened because the swing musicians at the time who were playing downtown felt that they were just basically entertaining people and they wanted to take their music, African-Americans at that time, and, um, to, uh, to be a form of high art, right? And so they would have these sessions at Minton's Playhouse after their gigs. And during that time, um, they would actually experiment. And some of the mistakes, like for example, hitting the, 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 the kick drum uh, at, at a wrong time became dropping bombs in bebop jazz drumming, for example. So a lot of the mistakes actually, okay, um, happen, um, uh, turned, on, um, turned out to actually lead to new innovation. So the importance actually of actually sometimes being wrong is another valuable lesson to embrace actually being wrong, okay? Which might be seen as maybe being dumb or being, you know, the stigma of being dumb in some certain scientific circles. In jazz, you know what? Sometimes making a mistake um, can be can take the music to a different level. Okay. Um, I want to now talk about um, how jazz is an innovation. Um, um, parallels um, physics. Um, okay, I just did talk about that. I, I talked about that when I talked about the, uh, me and my, my postdoc advisor. But another place where that plays itself out is, um, is if you look at how group improvisation happens um, with jazz musicians, right? You have a rhythm section, let's say, and it's holding the form. It is holding the pulse, the tempo, you know, the harmonic structure to support the soloer. And then someone else will solo and the rest of the band, including the previous soloer, is gonna support that solo. But you know, there's actually a, a call and response. It isn't like, if you're actually soloing something, um, the entire unit might and should and can respond to what you're doing in real time. So there's also a back reaction going on during that solo. And the places where I've seen um, really, really great physics being done, especially theoretical physics, is when there's a group of us and we recognize the importance of when someone is saying something or playing with an idea that the rest of us are listening, like the, like the rhythm section, to hold, hold a space for that person to do their solo, to do their riff. And sometimes even if they say something that's interesting or silly or whatever, it comes back, it comes to somebody else, they play with that and they throw it back at the other person, right? So, and it's sort of like, there's a greater, you know, there, there is a, a, a gestalt that comes out of that. And that might be a new innovate, a new idea, a new paper, right? And I, I want us to think about that. Do we do, we do enough of that when, when we're engaging with, um, with other, others who might, may think differently or approach problems differently or say things that may be the wrong jargon or what have you, right? Are we doing that? Um, I'm gonna, um, um, look at the time I, um, and let, let me actually pause here um, and now um, maybe get engaged in, in some conversation and dialogue um, moderated by Paul. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Um, we've already had one question and let me uh, encourage uh, anyone who would like to ask uh, Professor Alexander some questions 
to just type them into the Q&A link at the, just click on that link at the bottom of the page and you can type in your question. So I've already got one question here and it comes from a questioner who is a philosopher and a saxophonist and also a former physicist who is currently uh, writing a book that will treat Duke Ellington's use of timbre. And the question is, can you say something about the role of timbre in jazz improvisation? Yes, great question, great comment statement actually. And I think it's, it's central because one of the things, um, so for example, I'll give an example, two examples. One of the things that Arnold Coleman told me, he spoke about, it's a sound. He didn't talk about it's a bunch of chords or a, a, a line or what he, oh, central uh, be, uh, aside from the idea of, the, of, of ideas, right? Um, um, and you know, what he sometimes call homilotics is sound. And when I think about what is synonymous with that is timbre, is basically the arc of a, of a tone of the, the richness embedded in the sound of the instrument or the musician themselves, their, in, their individual voice, you know? And so, yes, I think it's an important thing. I mean, a big part, especially the tennis sax player, a big part of what we spend much of our life doing is developing our own, our own timbre, our own unique signature sound. That's what's gonna distinguish us from everyone else. Thanks for that question. So the next question uh, goes back to your story about Orna Coleman. Did Ornette ever expand upon or answer his question to you of where does an idea come from? Um, no, <laughs> no, the answer is um, no, but I think that statement, it was sort of like, it just led me, it really took me down for the rest of my career, this, that rabbit hole, you know, you know, like where does an idea come from or the experience uh, Can you just say that last part again, Stefan? You froze here for a minute. Yeah, so the idea of like putting the idea at the forefront, the experience of like, of, <clears throat> yeah, the, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This the experience of putting the idea at the forefront. To me, that experience, I think is what Oynet was pointing to. So the next question uh, um, comes from a questioner who says that uh, he's always felt that doing physics is much like playing jazz standards. There's a structure that must be obeyed, but then one can innovate around that. Uh, the questioner is guessing that you might agree with that. I can 100% totally agree with that. Um, and of course, um, there is structure. I mean, the best example, one of my favorite examples is a 12 bar blues, right? You know, four counts every bar, 12 bars, and then it repeats itself. It's a cycle. And in that structure, right, you improvise around that structure. Now, the other thing is that in free jazz, though, um, you loosen that structure up and you let actually what you do inform, the structure now becomes generative. And that's also very interesting. So the next question is, would you please expand on the dynamic of learning the rules on one hand and learning to improvise in jazz on the other? That's a tough question. I'm, sure, I'm, 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 trying, I'm still trying to learn that. I mean, I think one of the things that, let me just say is that when I talk about um, I think one of the things maybe we, we forget in physics or in, 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 in learning science is that it took our predecessors hundreds of years, thousands of years to come up with some of these ideas. And in jazz, there really is a sense of like, this is, this is really big. This is big, they, you know, the music is really big. And as a result, you know, you're gonna spend, you know, you could save it and spend your time um, learning this entire universe of things. Um, um, but I, I would say that my desire to improvise and, and um, is, you know, drives and, and, um, and inspires and motivates me to practice um, the necessary skill set. And it's something that's going to take me the rest of my life to continue doing. 
as with my, my, my scientific craft. I forget things. Um, we have the professors have the advantage of remembering because we have to teach this stuff, but the truth of the matter is we forget a lot of the, the things that we have to teach. <laughs> I don't want to actually incriminate the other professors. I, I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> so um, next question, when you close your eyes while listening to some great jazz, what does your mind's eye see? Images, patterns, math? Oh, that's a good question. Sometimes it sees, um, so yeah, sometimes it sees it sees um, what I'm hearing. Um, I mean, right? If you're if you're in that state of flow, if you whatever, if you're just in the sound and the sound is in you, then that's where you're at. Okay. Sonny Rollins once told me I interviewed him for my book. Uh, we interviewed. We, sp we spent hours. He didn't want to stop talking. He was such a such a nerd. Um, he goes, you know, Stefan. This really surprised me. He goes. When I'm playing, and this is Sonny Rollins, right? Uh, he goes, when I'm playing, I'm not thinking. So the next question, um, would you recommend that the arts, studying the arts, arts like music, can be beneficial for someone pursuing any career? I think, I, I think it's a wellspring of the human intellect. Yeah, the answer is it's a necessity, I think. Not by the way, when I say when I let me say the word, it's not even studying it, right? I, I mean, right? It's it's sort of like engaging with it, right? Uh, next question: uh, As a scientist, are you drawn to the mathematics of microtonal music, just intonation, etc., like jazz by Philip Gerschlauer? Um. The answer is to some extent, you know, I actually do, you know, I didn't talk, I do, I, I do some research on, on that stuff, you know, the mathematics of, um, of music and music perception and things like that um, with people like Robert Rowe at NYU, Steinhardt, um, Elaine Chu. Um, so there is a lot, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. One of the things I don't want to actually, I want to stay away from this is, the idea of like mathematizing music and you know, they all have their role and it's fun and you can jump into that stuff right but you know um and the idea of microtonal music and at the end of the day I, I i like to also engage music from a more also from a cultural perspective and pr perspective of like you know um you know, one of the things I'm going to really enjoy doing once um, the dust settles and we can really travel on a much better, it's actually go visit countries and, and really just embed myself in the culture um, and hearing the music through the lens of that culture. Because there's, there, is a, there is a cultural lens, obviously, in, in, in all the musics of humanity. Let me say, add, add to that. You know, there are three cultural universals. Maybe there's more, but the three I know of is every culture has language. Um, every culture had some type of creation story about the or question the origins of, of the world. The other one is that every culture had music, every single culture. And that to me is really interesting about, you know, how we think about humanity. So the next question is from an elementary school te music teacher who says that the Smalls Jazz Club vignette resonated with him because he emphasizes the making of mistakes in the classroom. What advice do you have for engaging students in the innovative and creative processes, especially when it comes to proudly making mistakes? Thanks for, um, for, for that question. Um, let me um, say that, and I like how um, the question of the teacher used the word proudly, proudly um, making mistakes. I think you know, it reminded me of my, um, when I taught at, um, at Haverford College, which, you know, was a, is a school like UO that puts a lot of emphasis and value on teaching and pedagogy. And I remember, um, you know, I had, a, I had a, one of my senior colleagues, they would sit in my class and evaluate my teaching. And it's interesting, um, this professor, Walter Smith, um, he's, he was, and then he comes to me the next day with a long list. Oh, Jesus, what, in, in red ink, by the way. <laughs> and he goes, um, you know, you missed a great opportunity. I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, 
when you were giving your lecture, you made a mistake. I made a mistake. I actually, you know, maybe had a sign error. I did something, whatever. And he said, you tried to hide it. And I was like, yeah, I, I kind of did because I'm the professor. I'm supposed to know this stuff. He goes, that was a teaching moment. In other words, you making that mistake, right? Your students seeing that, seeing you make the mistake, doesn't take away from the fact that you're the professor and da da da, but you can by transforming in real time that mistake into you know the more correct answer would have been this amazing teaching um, experience because it shows them also it teaches them exactly that you know what I made a mistake and guess what you know there's no shame in that because if I can make a mistake and then and the most important thing is not is that you're gonna make a mistake it's what you do about it. And how you fix it? How do you try to? How do you try to get out of it? And how do you engage your class? So that's a really, really important thing, and something that I really try to wear on my sleeve. Um, it's very difficult to because oftentimes you make mistakes. You give a lecture, or give a seminar, and your colleagues are like, "This guy, he really, you know, he really doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, he's not the real deal." But you know, I think these are the important things that we have to, in terms of when we think about transforming the academy and really getting our really bright students awakened, right? and making breaking new grounds are these kind of things so thanks for asking that question yeah it's interesting you just answered a question a very similar question asked by another questioner which you just provided an answer to so i'll i'll, I'll skip that one and go to the next one it feels that the current status quo in the scientific publication process is to suppress ideas that the community sees as wrong or deems to not fit properly into the zeitgeist do you think that this is inhibiting some part of scientific progress? If not, can you express why uh, are the questioner's feeling on the status quo may be misguided? Yeah, this is a very, this is a tough one. It's a fine line because I mean, the fine line between, you know, flat earth theory is like, you know, an idea that maybe <laughs> we know it's not correct, right? So it's like, well, why are you suppressing my idea, man? Flat earth, right? But, you know, but again, the, the fine line is that there are other ideas and other, you know, ways of doing things, ways of being, ways of thinking, right? That can potentially carry value if, um, if, if processed um, and, 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 and we have space for that, we have more space for that, right? In um, the way we do science and the way it, it, it's formalized in the academy, the various ways it is formalized, you know, seminars and all publications and all these kind of things. If we, um, because let me say it another way, um, some of these ideas sometimes, you know, um, might shun you, might, you know, I call them dark ideas. My book, Fear of a Black Universe, is about black in the sense of that which is um, um, shunned, that, you know, uh, um, um, that which is um, misunderstood, that which is, you know, we give names for things that we don't understand. Um, we call it black, you know, um, black, you know, black holes, singularity, dark matter, dark energy, right? Um, so my point there, if you go into that book when it comes out, I can't, I really go into this 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 issue here, um, uh, you know, in, in its full glory. But in a nutshell, I would say that um, we have to be careful about how people feel shamed and shunned for certain from ideas. For example, you know, not too long ago, the, to bring up the idea of consciousness in physics was laughable, but now you know. People are getting more and more comfortable talking about that in more in, in more interest in ways that um, are more acceptable, right? So there are things like that where you know, like a no-go zones. You know, if you're a scientist, you're not taking this seriously. And I think those are the places where there is opportunity to take it to the next level if people don't feel as judged or shunned or uh, stigmatized. And it's the way we, as a community, you know, let the, let those voices be heard is going to be important value in it as yes if we're smart and we have our skill set we might be able to no one ever died from theorizing let's put it that way or no one ever died from like trying unless it blows up in your face an experiment it could lead to something interesting i guess that's what i'm saying um next question what do you think about the movement towards increasing specialization where engineers for example don't study the humanities at all and humanities students don't study these sciences and engineering at all. What's your view about that? I mean, I think all those things for me, they have their place, right? So, you know, but just call for what it is. I mean, 
you know, um, I think, but I think if it becomes the um, status quo and we want to call that, you know, scientific innovation, um, right? Or um, yesterday's specialization, I mean, sorry, today's specialization was a, was a field that emerged out of many different, you know, um, fields, right? My field in cosmology um, really was like, you know, first of all, it was really a field in philosophy it was laughable in terms of being a precision science, and um, its modern version is really a you know a you know combination of astrophysics, particle physics, you know general relativity. Right? It's it's a it's a creolized science, and then for somebody to say, oh, "I'm a specialist, I'm a cosmologist," I think it's kind of laughable, honestly. Uh, next question: Have you ever experienced reaching a point where you're expecting more than you are capable of? And it takes you to a place where your motivation to continue is negatively affected. How do you work through those moments? Yes, I have those moments. <laughs> and um, how do I work through it? Um, yeah, sometimes I have to leave it alone, right? I have to leave it alone, go on a walk, um, um, drink a nice glass of wine, watch a movie. I don't, um, yeah, sometimes it's good to, 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 to step away from, uh, from it. Um, jazz and music in general is commonly seen as a form of expression. Do you feel like science is another form of expression or adds to your ability to express through music? If so, in what ways? How could young musicians apply that to their learning if they are also interested in the sciences? Good, good. I think it's really important. I mean, again, let's go back to, to play. What do I mean by this? Um, what, is, what do we mean by play? Um, I take something, okay? Um, I take, here's a born scale that you must learn, right? Um, um, how about I do that? Let me, let me get my horn on, play, play with a scale. Is that cool? Okay. So this is how I play. I play with an idea. So first of all, I got to warm my horn. I haven't touched it in two days. <laughs> okay. So I don't know. Let's play with my um my major and minor pentatonic scale. Minor uh, pentatonic scales built from just a sequence of perfect fifths, right? Right. So, so that's a scale. And for me, playing with that means that you know. You know, I just played a note that was really outside of that scale, just to hear and to play with it. I just added another one. structure and you play with it and see what you hear that's yeah so the next question comes from a, a, a giant in the music scene of eugene oregon carl whiteck and he asks what kind of tenor is that oh thanks for asking that question it is my celebrated 1967 selma mark six which is the same year and make as sonny rollins tenor but 
The difference is that he plays a million times better than me. <laughs> so the point is that, like, you know, I'm such a fan that I was like, yeah, maybe if I get Sonny Rollins' is four and I could sound a little bit more like Sonny, but. Um, oh, by the way, you know, there is a, going back to the question of sound, someone asked about Tomber. One of my favorite John Coltrane albums is called Coltrane Sound. And there's some artists that did the melt, he had a melted, you know, one of my favorite songs, Central Park West on that album. I know, I know Paul is like, you know, a New York lover. He's a fellow homeboy. So Carl has a, uh, he wants you to know that, that his is a 1965. Oh man, you got the Michael Brecker. I think Brecker's horn was in that, more in that range, right? Ask him. Yeah. Let's see if he responds. He's not responding. I'll ask a question while uh, we'll see if Carl responds. Um, you, you mentioned the necessity of outsiders and you've said a little bit about the book that's forthcoming and you are wearing a t-shirt of the National Society of Black Physicists. So That's right. why don't you, why don't you this was tell designed by This was designed by um, one of our students. Um, 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 yeah, so. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Society of Black Physicists and the importance of bringing uh, black students into the field of physics? It's extremely important to me um, since I was one of those students, um, but I think it's important to all of us. <laughs> Um, or actually, um, Professor Samantha um, Sullivan, NSBP, um, Harvard under, uh, senior, um, who um, just gave her an amazing talk the other day. Um, anyway, so um, yes, because you know, there. I, I to be selfish, I, I really, you know, I just gain a lot of joy. Um, I mean, NSBP, I have to wear many. I guess many hats um, serve in the organization. I was once a student at NSBP when I was an undergraduate. It's very common that in the spirit of um, a big part of what we're about is service. Um, so if you're a student, you benefit from the mentoring and support of um, the older generation. And then one day you, yeah, you know, become that person to help support um, the, and you know, our, for me, it's really about, right, um, about that excellence, right? About black excellence. I mean, and jazz is a form of black excellence. And, you know, we really feel that we have something really cool to say and contribute um, in the scientific enterprise in physics. And I really truly believe um, by us just simply being who we are, um, we can be, you know, we can support um, and, and, and contribute to, um, to the enterprise of science. We have in the past, and I think that there's a lot of potential. And simply speaking, I really, um, it brings me, I just get a lot of joy, especially we expanded student activity, we expanded stud uh, student leadership, and it's really good to see them taking the baton and supporting each other and supporting each other's success and really pushing the, the envelope of excellence. And, you know, despite the fact that, yes, I mean, there are challenges, um, we can always, you know, ask more of ourselves and of um, society at large, but we also recognize, I mean, there was a time when, you know, when NSBP was formed in 1978, when a lot of some powerful people in the scientific community came forward and said that they don't think that Black people could actually do physics. So, you know, we've went, we've gone from that to now um, a 2000 strong membership. And you know, a lot of our members actually are not black physicists, right? We have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of support um, as well from the outside community. We have a lot of ambassadors and I think it's very exciting um, to be part of this and, um, and, to, and to get that wink of support um, from the larger community. Well, Stefan, we have no more questions in the in the Q and A box. Uh, your final answer, I think, is a wonderful answer to end our uh, session with you today. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts about jazz and about physics with us today. It's been a real pleasure uh, listening to you and talking to you. Hey, thanks for having me. I look forward to seeing you all in person um, when the dust settles. <laughs> Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us for this talk with Stefan Alexander. For more information on other upcoming virtual events sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center 
and to contribute to supporting such events and research programs like today's lecture, visit ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks again to Giant Banavar and Richard Taylor and the UO Physics Department and the Division of Equity and Inclusion in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, take care, everyone, and we'll see you next time.